Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Sunday Brunch. I hope you are enjoying your day. It is hot outside because right now, Alexa says it's 90 degrees. Oh. And, um, but I'm okay. If I have a little bit more of this wine, it's going to feel more like 100 degrees. <laughs> you know how that happens. <laughs> Folks, you know I had to throw this in there. You know I have to have a little joke. But today we are welcoming Paul Dennison. But before we get to Paul, Jackie is back. Thank you, Jackie. Hi. Thank you for coming in. No problem. Thank okay. you, Jackie. And um, my co-host, Anthony Spirito. Hi, Anthony. Anthony Hello, a, everybody. Anthony had a fabulous party. That I, I heard party. about that. Mm. With a capital F. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a capital F. It was a fabulous, fabulous party. Everybody was good. Two apartments and the food was spread out with a drink. And he had on house music. And that's one of the first things I said when I walked in, Anthony, right? I said, do I hear house music? Yeah. Okay, By the way, the, the, food, the food could have been garbage. Uh, but, <laughs> was, but because we had the house music on, Renee that's was happy. Yeah. Renee was a happy man. Yeah. <laughs> and Paul Dennison. Paul, welcome to Sunday Brunch. Thank you for welcome, being here Paul. Today. Good to be here in the house. Paul, oh, give us a little um, information about yourself. Well, I, I met Paul through, now how did I meet you, Paul? I met you through Olga? No, I met Olga through you. We met somehow. We met somehow um, in the last month. And then I was introduced to you and then we made the connection and I got involved with cooking and all additional cooking through Paul. So Paul, tell us a little about yourself. All right. Um, I live here in Jersey City, been, been in Jersey City since uh, 88, 89, uh, and have lived in the Bergen Hill neighborhood since 93. Um, I'm a uh, management consultant, uh, and I actually took over a company that my parents ran for over uh, 25, uh, 20, 20 plus years, oh, really? uh, based out of DC. Uh, we did a lot of work around uh, housing and a community development um, as consultants, as HUD consultants, sort of traveling around the country. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things uh, I used to take when I used to do projects and, and, and work, uh, two things I used to take. I used to take uh, my golf bags, mm -hmm. my, my karate gear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure because uh, uh, you know you're doing work but you need to you know relieve some stress yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but I also uh, uh, visit a lot of restaurants so nice. uh, I remember places by whether or not the food is good that's a great criteria Yes, for I judging whether or not yeah. something is good or bad. It's, yeah. it's all about the food. Yeah, not that, that, that food is good all the time because everything messes up every once in a while. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but since, uh, you know, my folks retired in 2016 and, and I, uh, 2016, I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what am I going to do uh, when I grow up? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I took my bag of tricks uh, you know, around housing and community development and decided to uh, uh, get involved in the art scene. Nice. Uh, oh, really? And have been, been trying to change the narrative uh, and work with other folks uh, around changing the narrative uh, of arts, uh, not just to be something uh, to take a look at, um, but something that, that impacts the, uh, the different aspects of, of, of life right. and quality of life issues, education, health and well-being, uh, um, and also economic and community development and uh, creative thinking. So you can use arts to, to, to think through problems. Yeah. And use creative people to help you think, think, think through problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at art, you know, art as an asset and, and, a, and, a, and a tool to uh, you know, heal and, and help solve problems. And, uh, and so that's kind of what I've been, been doing and, uh, and food is part of culture. It uh, truly so is, Paul. <laughs> it is. Aspect. 
do we that. Are, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, uh, I mean, you could solve a whole lot of problems if you have have a bunch of people sitting around the table eating some good food. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. They, they Amen to that. True. Amen to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And then sometimes, and then sometimes we know this. Um, lots of times, we say everybody say, for instance, there's six of us eating, and it's quiet. And what is that slogan? The food must be good because good. That's right. talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's right. yeah. And which we were talking about food earlier. Now we started off talking about fish, correct? Um, before right. the show started. Mm -hmm. which I love. I think one of my favorite fish is red snapper. I like, yeah, red snapper, I would say that's my number one fish mm -hmm. um, that I like to fry. Mm -hmm. Shrimp is good. Mm -hmm. Tilapia, you know, there are people out there saying tilapia is not real fish. Have you ever heard of that before? I have, yeah. I, there's, there's, it, it's amazing how passionate people get about <laughs> this fish that you know up until a few years ago nobody even heard of exactly. but you know i mean you know it's farmed i mean it's not exclusively farmed but there mm -hmm. there's a lot of tilapia that's farmed but there's a lot of tilapia that's not farmed that's okay. caught wild um but people get very passionate about oh you shouldn't be eating tilapia because it's you know it's, it's farmed and it's, it's fake and it's this and it's that but you know who cares uh, cool. if you I've like heard, it you like it i've heard if it you being called a gutter fish like um look there's uh, a lot uh, of fish that's like gutter fish. fish yes and I, i'm yes. sorry i think listen when tilapia is made well it's good it's, good. it's delicious exactly yeah yeah absolutely yeah. you know uh, and you can make that argument about uh you know lobster is one of the most expensive yes. pieces of seafood you can buy Thank and you. that's right. a bottom. That's a bottom feeder. So yeah. sure. yes, years years ago, I think we talked about it once before, Anthony and I, and we all probably heard of it. That lobster years ago was fed to the slaves because it was thought of as the roach of the of sea. Theme. That's right. right. And lobster was given to the slaves, and they were just tearing it up. They sure did. <laughs> it's just oh, like, like caviar. Hey, this caviar, is the same thing. caviar was a, a, a delicacy like it wasn't even expensive back in the day my father used to tell me they used to go and get uh fish eggs that's what they just call it yeah, fish, fish eggs. eggs yeah they would just yeah. go and get fish eggs and put it on whatever they were eating you know seafood sometimes chicken too and it yeah. wasn't expensive now forget about it caviar is expensive oh <laughs> and you must eat it with the yeah, uh, like, uh, ivory spoon the, because the fish does something to it. Yeah, you know, but but I like so my from for my money, uh, I my favorite fish is cod. Um, oh, I made that last week. It's yeah. a very it's sort of um, I don't want to say uh, if I say blank canvas, I don't I don't want to I don't want to say I'm not saying that it has no taste. It's a tasty fish, but mm -hmm. it's neutral. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not as strong as a, as a salmon. No, it's not as strong as, um, as a, as a bass, mm -hmm. but it's, it's just neutral enough that you can, uh, it's, it makes it a very versatile fish. You can put it in, you could put it in fish cakes. You can fry it. You can roast it mm -hmm. with all kinds of herbs. You know, mm -hmm. one of the, one of my favorite dishes is just to roast cod with some thyme and right. some garlic and some olive oil. It's yeah. very simple, very easy. Yeah. And uh -huh. cod is also uh, fairly inexpensive. It's yeah. not as expensive as salmon, certainly yeah. not as expensive as um, some of the other varieties of fish that you can buy. Yeah. And, uh, and actually you can even go, you can go to the grocery store and you can either buy it fresh or you can buy it frozen. So it makes it convenient too. Right. And, and you mentioned salmon. I'm going to go back because Paul and I, I was on the phone with Paul and I told him I was going to do some cod and he mentioned what's I going to do. Well, your butt, <coughs> excuse me, the salmon. I was doing something on the internet and I saw this fish. I said, oh, this is salmon. And they didn't call it salmon. They called it steel, I think, let me get it right. Steelhead trout. Trout, yeah, steelhead trout just like 
salmon. It does look like salmon because it's large and oh, it's yes. long, but it, it actually, it, it tastes nothing like salmon. Like salmon yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it looks because like. Because the, the flesh is completely different. It's actually a much more, it's a, it's a, it's a milder fish than okay. salmon. Salmon, salmon is, is a very fatty, yeah, uh, fishy fish. Um, even though you can prepare it, there are certain ways you could prepare it where yeah. it, it's not fishy, but mm -hmm. steelhead trout is very different. Um, yeah, but, but, it, but it looks I, like it. Yeah, because we were in, um, what's that the store? Not ShopRite, there's a, another big one. Stop and, and shop? No, no. Um, Dwight Little? Acme. No, not Acme. This is another one, another big big store. Let's guess, store. let's guess the grocery store. Come on. <laughs> It'll, it'll come to me. You can't remember the name yeah. of the so I remember because I was buying the cod and I looked down and I saw this. I said, oh, look, they got salmon here. And I'm passing by. Then when I learned about the steelhead um, trout mm -hmm. and then we went back to the store, it'll come to me. I said, look, there's a steelhead and here's the salmon. So if someone was in there shopping and they didn't pay attention, they could have picked up the steelhead and got home and fixed it and said, oh, this tastes better than the other one, not realizing it's two different fish. Yeah, two different fish. Yeah, but Paul, you was telling me, um, you asked me if I was gonna fix the cod, which way, do you remember? Oh, no, you said you didn't have, you, you didn't have uh, fries. And I said- uh, Oh, right, 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 right. right. Missing chips and, and, and without having fries. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was <exactly. laughs> Okay. Ah. So speaking of the subject, uh, today, uh, I, I volunteered today at the Riverview Farmer's Market in, um, mm. here in the Heights. And they have, um, there's, there's a fishmonger downtown Jersey City called uh, Jersey City Fish Stand. And their fish is really, really, really high quality stuff. Um, and they had today at the uh, at the at the at the farmers market they had monkfish. Monkfish, oh, is, heard of monkfish is really really good, right? Yes, it's it an is. ugly fish physically, yes, but I mean it's delicious. They call it the poor man's lobster, yes. um, but Very it's true. really good. And and I had the last time I went, I was in London. Uh, I had a dish of fish and chips that was made, which is this is not common because normally. Uh, fish and chips is made with either cod or uh, scrod. Right. It was made with monkfish. Mm -hmm. ah. It was outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. Really? I would mm -hmm. say anybody who loves to make fish and chips out there, go to go to the Jersey City Fish Stand. I'm I am not a I'm not a paid promoter of Jersey <laughs> City Fish Stand. I'm just saying that they're a local business and they're actually very good. They, they source their fish from the best places, uh -huh. high quality stuff, and they uh -huh. have monkfish available on a regular basis. I uh, am going, what's so the name of this place? It's called Jersey City Fish Stand. It's on Jersey Avenue between Columbus oh, and uh, Newark Avenue. Yes. Oh, Clyde may know that spot. He's, oh. he's from that. So Paul, how, how, were, how, did, were you, how did you make your fish when you had the fish and chips, because I didn't have the chips. And, and, uh, and, and Paul tell me that's a sacrilege. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't have fried fish and not have the chips. But you know what? I looked at my refrigerator and I had some chips in there. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's all board, but it worked. So tell us, Paul, how, how do you fix your voice? You should uh, do something else uh, if you don't have any chips. Um, Either saute it or, or broil it um, or a poach it. Okay. Poaching. Sous vide. Yeah. Sous vide. Sous vide. Yeah. Sous vide. I didn't even think the poach. I, I, yeah. Sous vide after I hung up the phone. Huh? <laughs> no, I said I thought sous vide after I hung up the phone. Oh, oh. <laughs> some of us have a sous vide. And some of us have to use the regular pot and try to keep the water out of hundred. Oh, Anthony. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that, that's, easily, that's, easily, that's easily done. You don't need to have a sous vide. No. You don't need to have uh, a sous vide stick mm -hmm. to sous vide. 
if yeah. you have, you were talking about uh, the other day getting a um, an induction burner. Yeah. Right? But an induction burner will hold the temperature steady. Uh -huh. So you don't need a sous vide stick. You could just put a pot of water on an induction burner, mm -hmm. set the temperature. Mm -hmm. You just need to make sure that whatever induction burner you get can can uh, reach an exact temperature, not like a rounded up temperature. Uh -huh. But just make sure that that whatever burner you get, you can get an exact temperature, and that that induction burner will hold a temperature steady for as long as you want. So you don't so, need a sous vide stick to sous vide. Now, when I was in culinary school at Hudson County, um, we used from time to time the induction burners like you have, Anthony. Um, put the pot on, do with it. But I don't remember being told that it's, can be, it can replace a sous vide. It can. It absolutely yes, you're right can. because, because it, you get that number. You say 145 degrees. Yes, it's stay in there. It will hold. It will hold that temperature for as long as you want, and yeah. that's that is the that's the essence. That's the fundamental of sous vide cooking. It's holding a temperature consistently <laughs> yeah. and steadily right. for mm -hmm. a period of time, so that your protein it doesn't have to be protein. It could be it could be vegetables too. Yeah, but whatever it is that you're cooking is held at a steady temperature over time. Well, have you cooked using sous vide? Uh, well, first, I'm, I'm going to be really, 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 really honest. <laughs> Come on, let it out. Let it out. <laughs> and I know, I know some of y'all remember your mom pulling out the stofers with the birds. <laughs> I mentioned absolutely. Yes. On a pot of boiling water. Yes. So I've, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> You put it in the pot of water, that's a sous vide, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I sous vide, I sous vide my, my stove top stuff. <laughs> yes, and then they have, and then they have the rice, it's a pre-cooked rice in the pouch to take it and put it in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Mini rice. <laughs> I just want to keep it real. Um, but but I, I, I will say this, though. Like, I, I had never in my life up until a few years ago, even known what sous vide was. But if you're making any type of, I mean, particularly if you're making a protein, right? Whether it's a salmon filet, a beef filet, lamb, uh -huh. pork, whatever it is, you seal that in a plastic enclosure mm -hmm. and you put that in a sous vide and you invest, it really, it's not a huge amount of time. It's probably about an hour for most things, chicken, pork, fish, you invest an hour of time, that, that piece of protein is perfectly, mm -hmm. perfectly cooked. Mm -hmm. It's been held at the proper temperature for the proper amount of time. And then all you have to do is you remove it out of the plastic enclosure and you sear it off. And you get the color. Yeah. And it is fantastic. That is really the only way I eat steaks now. Oh, uh, I really? sous them because it's yeah. worth it's worth an hour of your time to submerge it in some hot water, so that at the end of the cooking time, you literally for one minute on each side just brown it off. Mm -hmm. Wow! Perfect. Perfect Some, somebody asked at the culinary club. Um, they wrote in and said, "What does monkfish taste like?" And I would like to know also because I've. I don't think I've ever had it. It's it's a sweet it's a it's a sweet type of fish. It, it's a, it's a white fish, but it's sweet and it has a similar flavor profile to lobster. And also the consistency of the flesh is also approximates lobster. Now, is it expensive? Yes, it it's is. not cheap. This is not tilapia we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Tilapia, oh. like they can, they give it away. But, no, monkfish is expensive. Mm. What you say, Paul? Back in the day, monkfish used to be uh, inexpensive because it wasn't a choice cut type of yeah. fish. 
I know it's an ugly fish. It's an ugly it's, fish, it's yeah. Ugly people are afraid, fish. supposedly afraid of it. Like, oh my God, I don't want to get that. Ah, what's it going to do yeah. to you when, you when it's in your stomach? Oh my God. Really? <laughs> really, really good. It's really, really good. It is. Yeah, like oxtails. Oxtails used to be really cheap. Now they're... Oh, ex not anymore. Uh -huh. I bought I bought a couple of I bought a few pounds of oxtails in Costco, which you know Costco is not super expensive, but mm -hmm. oxtails were pricey. They were yeah. pricey. They're yeah. really good. Love oxtails, but get yeah, your neck so bones in there. You better get your yeah. neck bones in now because that's going to get expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All of these, yep. all of these things that were like the low man on the totem pole yep. when it came to cooking. Now yeah. everybody's discovering them, and they're becoming much more expensive. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. That that's what's happened, and because of of the pandemic we had, we slowly coming out of prices go sky high as uh, well. Yep. Yep. Because you know people are trying to get a hold of them, and the market say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then the market's got to go out and buy the product, but nobody wants to um, take a job in a restaurant these days. Why? Because they probably bring it home more from unemployment than they was working in the restaurant. Yeah. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, there's signs up all over the place. Help wanted, help wanted. I, think I have not. I mean, every restaurant I have passed in the last month, uh -huh. all of them. Without exception, all of them have had help wanted signs. We need yeah. we need runners, we need bus people, we need servers, we need line cooks, we need they are hurting right now. The restaurant industry is hurting. And it's it's uh, it's very unfortunate because it's coming at a time where everybody, you know, more and more people are vaccinated and more and more people are feeling secure about going out. So like like many other aspects of our economy, mm -hmm. there's a humongous amount of pent up demand, but there's not enough supply. So yeah. whether it's whether it's going to a restaurant, whether it's gasoline, whether it's you know there's all of whether it's microchips for automobiles, all of these things are causing prices to go way go way, way up. Where, up. Where, yeah. where we are in danger of having a huge problem with inflation because there is all of a sudden, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. all of a sudden, there is all of this demand that wasn't there, you know, a month ago. Yeah. And now all of these companies have to start ramping up and they can't ramp up fast enough to meet the demand. Yeah. Which, it's a, which is a good thing for them because it it supports prices, but it, it also makes the prices go up. So it's not great right. for consumers. Right, yeah. supply supply and demand. Yeah. What it's were you saying, Paul? There's been different types of disruption to the supply chain. Um, you've got uh, um, the pandemic aspect of it and safety and health issues. Uh, and people, you know, working in close proximity to each other. Uh, and then you've got a rising costs in, in delivery costs and trying to get access to materials. Um, and um, so a lot of these, these normal chains of, of getting access to things, it's been broken. So yeah. uh, that also, you know, raises, help, you know, raises costs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I find that all... Oh, and, and the whole thing with the restaurants not be so in this case today these days how is the quality of food coming out of restaurants when they can't hire a cook or a line cook or a chef to work so the quality of the food might drop a little bit because these professionals aren't there or maybe a chef will come in to work and um and he doesn't have four line cooks. So he's frustrated because he has to do their job and the demand in the front of the house is packed. So yeah. the quality of food is going to go down. People don't come back. Yeah, that's that's also an issue. And that's and that's a, it's a very real uh, issue that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people in the restaurant industry are facing every day. I mean, uh, 
Renee had occasion to meet a friend of mine who lives, uh, my neighbor, who is an executive chef for a restaurant, <clears throat> an Italian restaurant in Brooklyn. And he's having that precise problem. That is that there is a lot, of, all of a sudden, there's a lot of demand, but he can't get, he, he is down two line cooks. He's down a pizza guy. And so he's having to do all of this work himself. himself. And he and was saying that at the party. He was yeah. saying, yeah, I'm the line cook. I'm he's the, everybody. everybody. Yeah. And it's question and it's frustrating. And, and you so, know what's sad? If if I think also it, it's where um people maybe may not have that desire like they used to in reference to the restaurant industry. Meaning that you I think we lost Jackie. Did we lose you, Jackie? Yeah, <laughs> oh, there she oh, goes. Go. <laughs> and there's some people um, who just don't um, probably want to deal with the struggles of the industry. So they, they go off searching for something that's going to make, make a maybe a faster buck or a bigger buck mm -hmm. than what the restaurant is supplying. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. the only ones who, are, who probably will survive is, are the ones who still have a passion and desire for it. Yeah. And um, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. No, I was, I was saying, um, if you don't have that, that passion desire, you probably won't stay within the industry. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen some people yeah. come and go. I really have. I've seen some people come and go within the pandemic because maybe they're not getting the money or um, the money's not big enough yeah. for them. Yeah. And, they probably, some of them probably still need more, a little bit more training and a little bit more experience. But, you know, when you're watching some of these shows too, you start to think like, well, I can do that. I can do that. So why do I need this? Why do I need to sit here? You need to get the experience on your belt. You, I think you do. Yeah. I yeah. Just, and, and what happens to the distributors, um, the meatpacking companies, now the yeah. restaurants are closing yeah. and all, they the have all of that food Mm -hmm. in their freezers and are they distributing the food to um, outside of restaurants to, to families um, you don't see that I didn't see it much most of the time right. I saw food that was being distributed was onions carrots right. peppers you know mm -hmm. maybe some rolls maybe some I saw English muffins etc cetera, etc cetera. So what happened to all of that meat that was in the freezers? Did it stay there for a year and they're now distributing it? Or did they get rid of it and replenish it? Because they can only hold on to, I guess, uh, a, a, a rib roast, a roast for X amount of time before it, it messes up. What do you think, Paul? You, you look like you're thinking. <laughs> I want to pick up on one thing that Jackie said, and then I'll switch back to what 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 you were just talking about. Um, I, I think COVID has given people an opportunity to rethink their values and what they're passionate about, uh -huh. and 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 taking advantage of opportunities to retool themselves or to look at other things than to be in spaces that don't make them happy. Um, and so some of that, some of that is in the mix of what's going on. Uh -huh. uh, and then to your uh, uh, point, um, uh, Chef Rene, um, uh, now I, I just forgot my train of, train of thought. Um, yeah. I, was, I was referencing meat and being in the warehouses and, oh, and it's not being distributed to the restaurant. So what's yeah, happening to it? There, uh, some, you know, uh, Famous chefs, um, you know, like the owner of Red Rooster, uh -huh. uh, and Samuelson. then the uh, yes, Samuelson and the, and the Spanish chef, that, you know, yes. who, who's out of They have put together a, a different model uh, to do two things: uh, engage uh, those folks out of work to be in a position to take their skills. Take, you know, take advantage of, of, of supply that's not being used and to uh -huh. redistribute that uh, you know, through grants and other funding sources. 
and redistribute the, the, that to folks who are in need because there's a lot of folks who haven't been working and who, uh, who need food. And, and so they've been able to channel it to that way. And also to you know, the frontline workers who have been able, who've been on the front line of doing the work of, of, of healing uh, folks. Yeah, uh, and then take, plus, and plus them working in these restaurants, if they didn't like their job, this is a good way not to go back. Yeah, I collect, I collect the unemployment. I didn't like my job anyway, so I'm not rushing to go back because the chef was screaming and hollering at me. But then right. it, it makes the front of the house look and see how valuable the back of the house is. Mm -hmm. And if they are conscious of how they treated them, now they miss them. And they're, they're seeing, say, oh, you know what? I didn't know that so-and-so was that valuable and I took it for granted and tried to put him down and scream and holler, you're too slow, you're too slow. Now he's not there, what happens? Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, what happens? What, what do I do now? The whole thing is, when you get them back, if you get the same ones back, be nice. <laughs> yep, tell it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell it. Exactly. Because the ones that come back are usually the ones who really have that desire. I'm speaking on myself. <laughs> Yeah, because you went I back. Really, yeah, I went back and I really do have, I, I love food and hospitality. I really do. I know. I, know I really do. I love um, seeing people happy, but I, I will not tolerate being stepped all over either. No. Right. No. And I met Jackie at Hudson County Community College because that's when I was going there. And I used to see Jackie and we would talk back and forth and mm -hmm. that was going on. Mm -hmm. And then here today, we are still, you know, still hanging in there. We have a project that we're working on and still friends. Right. And that's the most important thing is yep. respect. Yep. These restaurants don't give their, their, their workers Employees. respect. That's right. Yeah. And then um, the, the, what is it? The hourly wage is going oh. to $15. Yeah. Now the restaurants can't get people to come there and work and they're, they're closing down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was one yeah, because they can't. Just fifteen dollars, fifteen dollars is too expensive for a lot of these places, and in now terms of an hourly wage. Yeah, yeah. At least that's what they say. Especially, especially the mom and pop places, I think too. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? I, I I question some of these restaurants. I know that they're paying enormous rent, enormous bills yeah. when it comes to they have a lot of gas. Yeah. So I'm, I said to myself in the very beginning, they're living on what they made the week before. But I was saying, but they were charging so much. And then I stopped to think. I said, well, they're overhead. They didn't have any money to put in the bank. What they meant, what they meant, uh, you know, made the week before. Right, went probably, out for expenses. Yeah, yeah. That's for gas. That's for electric. Yeah. They go home with nothing in the pocket. Yeah. It's a very, so, I mean, the restaurant business is a historically very thin margin. Yeah. Business. You're really not going to make uh, a lot of money. And that's why there's a lot of turnover in restaurant business. So restaurants typically only stay, oh, I mean, unless it's a rare exception, restaurants typically on average stay open maybe four, five, six years, and then they close down because yeah. uh, you can, you know, it's a hard business. It's a very hard business. And it's, it takes an enormous investment, not just of financial capital, but mm -hmm. uh, personal mental capital yep. to, to chain yourself to a business and not leave it for five years and to, and to basically work yourself to the bone. It's, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a friend of mine online, she's been asking these questions and she says, she likes this, I guess you're gonna go out and buy the monkfish. Cause she says, is it meaty? Is the monkfish meaty? Say that again, is it meaty? She wants meaty, meaty. It, it's, it is, it's a, it's a substantial, it's a substantial fish. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, it's not a thin, it's not like flounder. flounder yeah. No, it's not thin. It's, no. it, is, it is a substantial uh, fleshy fish, but it's not, um, it's not overly fishy. Uh -huh. it's, it's a very mild, mild white 
fish, but it's not it's not super flaky. It's it's uh, -huh. uh it's meaty. substantial. Maybe. Yeah, it is meaty. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. To answer her to answer her question in one word, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And she and she wants to know what wine goes with that particular monkfish. I mean, Pinot, Chardonnay, Pinot, whatever white yeah. you want. Yeah, it, uh, you know, go people, for something dry. Go, yeah, go for something dry. Don't yeah. don't do a riesling. No, <laughs> but you know riesling what? It's been said sweet. over the years. If you have if you have chicken or beef, you have a dark wine. If you have fish, da 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 da. It's a white wine. And then I was watching some show and they said, it really doesn't matter. matter. No. It doesn't because it's, yeah. at the end of the day, it's all about your preference and your taste. I mean, uh -huh. I very yeah. often will have, you know, with salmon, I'll have red wine. I won't have white wine, even though that's not prescribed. I'll melt it's just, yeah. you know, that's just what I feel like drinking. Yeah, yeah, because some people don't like red wine. So they have white right. wine yeah. with everything. Exactly. To me, it doesn't matter. What about you, Paul? You're quiet about this wine part. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, Riesling, you've got you've got dry Riesling and you've got some medium Riesling. So you've got a and sweet Riesling. So you've got a wide range of Rieslings that you could choose from. So I, I wouldn't want to run away from the Riesling. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah. I will tell you this though that you know if you're drinking Riesling from um, you know, German Riesling is one is probably the gold standard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but then you have regional Rieslings that are grown here in the U.S., particularly in the Finger Lakes uh, yep. in New York. You know, that's a very hit and miss proposition, right? Because right. you have your dry and you have your sweet, but. Mm, you know, the wines in the Finger Lakes are very hit or miss. I would, you know, out on Long Island, I think the the quality of the wines are a little bit more consistent than they are in upstate New York. Oh, really? Particularly yeah. with reds. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't mean to crap on Riesling. I do like Riesling. <laughs> I, I just prefer. <laughs> I just prefer. I prefer dry wines to to sweet wines when it comes to when it comes to fish. Yeah, the wine that I brought to your party, um, Anthony, that was sort of a dry wine. It was from South Africa. Oh yeah. Um, I buy it every. I forget the name of it. Some M E R E something like that. That wine is very good, and that's all I drank at your party. <laughs> and, and where do and where do you uh, where do you get that? Do you get that from Central Avenue Liquors? Yes. Okay. Nice. Now again, not promoting. You know, this is not a free advertising, <laughs> but I, you know, we're having a conversation. Just curious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have uh, they have um, two of uh, two types from South Africa, and I didn't want to take something that I was drinking like my house wine. So I said, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. I'm not Slow wine wine is just fine. Yeah, my wife's in the day, you know. You saw what we had. We had shit in a box. <laughs> oh, that, that's good too. That's right. That Anthony was Anthony was interpolated about the wine that was because he had the wine that I forget the name of it. It's in the box. It's it's with from, the, from that the, one, right. somebody gave me from one in one of my parts. That was good. It was really good. It, it lasted good. forever. I mean, <laughs> it did. I mean, that's, you know, you're talking about, uh, I can't remember how many fluid ounces, but it's a lot of wine. Yeah. In a box. And it doesn't look yeah. like it. No, it doesn't look like it, but it's a lot of wine. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And when we were talking about it, we, since you mentioned box, when I was at Fairleigh Dickinson, I took a wine class Ooh. and there was one particular wine. It was in a box. Of course, the bag was in it, but it was a wooden box. Oh, nice. I think That's it's with an R. I think mm -hmm. it's with an R. It was a, a square wooden box. So I went to Central Avenue and I asked Neil, I said, Neil, do you have so and so? And he says, never heard of that one. So he was never able to get it. But I think it was just uh, the fact that it's in a box mm -hmm. and the box had a nice print on it, et cetera, et cetera. And you can lift the thing up and take the bank out I and know. use the box for yes. something else. Yeah. yeah. But what are you paying for, Paul? The box, right? <laughs> That's why I don't do box wine. 
<laughs> I'm, I, look, I'm with that Paul. Is. I'm with <laughs> Paul. I'm not a big fan of box wine. Me neither. Uh, I, look, it was in our house. It's not my that choice. <laughs> this, yeah, there's but, another 50% of this relationship that likes, <laughs> that likes box wine. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you're talking, and now you're talking about wine. What about cooking with the wine? I made uh, a dish. Cooking, cooking with the wine is, I is cook, and I used the wine to to cook with, and I forget what dish it was. I think I was following the recipe, something I saw in the New York Times, and it's asked for for the wine, and then after you know cooked down, da, 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 and then we ate it. I was like, oh, this tastes kind of good, and the same with Laurel. You said, oh, this tastes good. I said, it's the wine. Now, um, I'm gonna go around. Paul, you cook with wine? I cook with everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I cook with, I cook with, with, with dry fino sherry. Yeah. I cook with Riesling. I yeah. cook with rum, bourbon, yeah. Yeah. vodka, gin. Mm. Gin, you, now that's, that's one I haven't heard of. <laughs> that's interesting. I can taste that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can taste that right now. I'll, I'll, I'll share the thing I did with gin. So, you know, a lot of times in steakhouses, you, you, you know, when you have your cocktail, you, you usually have a, a gin cocktail sometimes. Yeah, to start a martini. With, you know, with a martini or whatever. Right. So, and, well, let me rub my steak with a juniper rub. Uh, and then I'm going to pair that Ooh. with uh, a fruit gin sauce. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Wow. And were you pleased with the outcome? Oh, it's great. I'll, I mean, <laughs> okay. Okay, now. I would do that again. I've done it. I with, mean, you're uh, blowing my mind right now. I, uh, I, need, to, I need to investigate this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can talk. We can talk. <laughs> yeah, I need to know. I need to know about Paul this. puts <laughs> out some. Paul puts out some dishes at, at the culinary club. He definitely does. Nice. I mean, in the beginning, while well, you said, "Well, I'm trying this and I'm trying that," that's the only way to learn. Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, mean, yeah. I did a. I did. I'll share another story. I did it when I was working in D.C. There was a, a restaurant down the street from my office uh, called uh, Restaurant Columbia. Uh huh. And the, and the owner of the restaurant, uh, um, the first time I went in there for lunch, um, I just sort of sat there, ordered lunch, but then I started to watch, you know, what was going on in the restaurant, because I didn't know who was who. Uh, and then I figured out that the guy that was sort of barking orders at people, uh -huh. very quietly and quietly, was probably the guy that either is the manager or owner or maybe the chef. Yeah. And so I started talking to him. He ends up being the owner and the chef. Oh. Uh, so over the years, I'd go in there lunch, and he's looking for different ideas to do, you know, attract people into his restaurant. I said, why don't you do a guest chef, you know, event? Oh, yeah. And, 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 and uh, yeah, I'd like to, you know, just come in and, and, and cook and learn some things, you know, about you know, how you do stuff behind the scenes. Uh -huh. And he looked at me, he says, that's a great idea. And so I did, I, I did the, the first uh, uh, guest chef I did there, did duck breast. And you I had an idea chef? to do- You was the guest chef? Yeah, yeah. I, and, and we worked out the, the, the menu together. And I wanted to do a, a play on, on dessert, but, but for as, as, the, as the meal, the meat would be like a apple pie type of thing. Okay. Uh, and, said, let's do the duck breast, <coughs> do a, we'll do a coffee rub, um, and okay. then we'll do a vanilla risotto to pair it with. Okay. Wow. Yep. I, I, I'm, yep. Mm -hmm. And I then that. that's right the on, on, uh, the, on, on a, uh, a pie and ice cream type thing. Oh, snap. But as oh, me. Interesting. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it, it was crazy. Wow. <laughs> And uh, yeah, go ahead. We had uh, we had about twenty people that, that came in, and and we served that as as part of the as part of dinner. Um, wow! Back cooking, uh, you know, you know, yeah. cook like that. Mm. I saw on on television, and Anthony, you're next. 
um, it was a restaurant, I forget where it was. I think maybe down in the Lower East Side in New York. Um, there was no menu. You went there and the chef cooked, you ate whatever the chef decided to cook that night. No menu whatsoever. And the oh, restaurant God. was successful. Nice. Whatever nice. you fix, people went in. I guess they took a drink or bring your own brown bag or something like that. And they ate whatever he served. And I thought that was really interesting. That's like going to somebody's house. What are you cooking right. to I'm um, gonna throw this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Anthony, what about you with cooking with wine? Chef Anthony. <laughs> so my my uh ear my AirPod just died, so I didn't oh. hear what you just said. Oh, I'm, I was asking, um, what about you with cooking with wine? Oh, so I do cook with wine a lot. And of course, because we have multiple boxes of wine in our apartment <laughs> all the time, that's what I end up cooking with. <laughs> you can make a wine scoop in that case, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but, you know, I usually use, for, for most dishes, uh, I use Pinot Grigio. Mm. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of halfway between dry and sweet mm -hmm. and for, you know, whether it's risotto or it's a chicken dish or a pork dish, uh -huh. um, I usually use what that white wine to deglaze, uh, the pan that I'm, that I'm cooking in. If I'm making my tomato sauce. I use red. I use a. Uh, uh, you uh, didn't cinnamon. tell me the tomato sauce had wine in it. <laughs> oh, I did. Oh, no, he oh, was helping always. me. He was helping me jar. Oh no, the no, I don't. I don't put oh. it in the jar. Oh. I, I only. I only add it when I cook it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, <laughs> so I don't put it in the jar. Okay. Uh, but I use sort of a. I use a a, a substantial meaty red a cabernet. Yeah. usually or a merlot or um if it's an italian wine i'll use a sicilian uh nero diavola nice uh, those are those are very very thick uh meaty reds and that's what i like to put in the tomato sauce Good, really. uh but yes i do use i do use wine i even use wine um white wine in particular I use it when I saute vegetables. If I'm just sauteing a bunch of vegetables oh, in a saute great. pan, yeah. yeah, I mean, to, you know, invariably, if you're cooking over, even over medium heat, it's, you know, stuff is going to start to caramelize on the bottom of the pan, and you don't want the vegetables to do that, so you just add a little bit of white wine. Yeah, it loosens it up. That deglazes everything, loosens it up, and it also it imparts a very nice flavor. Yeah. Yes, Paul. Anthony, you like using a lighter white, uh, like uh, you mentioned a Pinot Grigio or or uh, either a Pinot or a Chardonnay. Okay. Um, Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, I don't use a lot of Sauvignon Blanc, but um, that's also an option. But usually, it's it's either Pinot Grigio or Chardonnay uh, when I cook with white. Mm, okay. And Jack A. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and do you cook with, with wines? I cook and I bake with wine. I like to use... And I um, drink with wine. Yes, yeah. of course. Well, I'm on my <laughs> start this one. I'm done pretty much. <laughs> I like to use, um, um, like Anthony said, Pinot Grigio with... Um, maybe chicken, mostly with um, fish and seafood. Mm -hmm. um, I use a red for um, maybe sauce, some of my, you know, beef uh -huh. um, items. I also like to use beer. Mm, um, yes, especially yes, when, you really yeah, yeah, when you do the cod, when you do the cod. Oh, not, not just that, not just yeah, that. I understand, I understand. When we're talking about vegetables, Anthony, I like to use beer with my vegetables. It, it just, oh, it, it, it I breaks do. out. Yeah. I use, I use a, I usually use like a stout beer when yes. I make cabbage, mm -hmm. when I braise cabbage, yeah. I'll braise it, I'll braise it in, in, in like dark beer. Now right. the stout does it stout is a heavy and heavy and and flavor. Does it over 
take over with the cabbage? No, no, no it does not. Okay. It does not. It it actually it makes I believe it makes the cabbage uh, yes. taste mm -hmm. even better. Mm -hmm. And and even though it's heavy, it would be heavy if you drank it. Yeah. But when yeah, you when you like cook it. with it, <laughs> but when you cook with it, all of the alcohol burns off right. anyway, yeah. and so yeah. does so does the carbonation. So really, all you're left with is the is the flavoring, and the flavoring is deep. It's thick, Dark, and, yeah. and it it really complements uh, the cabbage really well. Cabbage is like mm -hmm. cabbage is a pretty resilient vegetable, right? You really do need to braise it a long time yes, to get do. it to be tender. And and so the beer really is very helpful in that regard. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now, when I bake, uh -huh. I yeah, like so what do you do, put that in? I yes. put, like if I make, okay, let me give you an example. I made a blueberry, um, uh, blueberry banana bread Ooh. with a uh, rum glaze. And I, I like to use oh, okay. the, the rum, the rum to make my glaze, but also pineapple. So when yeah. you that, oh, okay. and the juices really come out. Oh God, I'm getting hungry now. The juices really come out and then you kind of let it sit and then you just nicely glaze it over the, you know, the, the bread and let it sit for a bit. It is so doggone good. I love working with all kinds of flavors. There was one time I even put um, a little bit of cayenne pepper wow. just to give it a little oomph in a, in a dessert. And it was- Oh, yeah, 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 I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. So I use everything. Just like Paul had mentioned, I use everything. I'm always like, I'm like my father, always trying to mix and do all kinds <laughs> of stuff in the kitchen. I get bored. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the same with me. I try to, I'll see a recipe and I'll try mm -hmm. this one, I'll try that one. I say, oh, yeah. this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. This one is not going to work. But then again, I'll go back at it and- right. Like Laurel said, you know, you're a chef, do something, make something of it, make it your own, which is a good thing. Well, if you know your seasonings, if you know what things taste like, you kind of mm -hmm. have it in your head already, like, hmm, maybe this will go with that. Maybe that'll go with this. And then yeah. when you try it out, you're like, oh, snap, I should have done this a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. 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 Like I, I mentioned, I think on one of the other shows, I was in here and I'm I was going to do an oven roaster, and I said, let me get these seasons together. I put them together, put it on the chicken, and dried the chicken, put it in the oven. It came out cold and brown. I, I mean, I was, I was amazed myself. <laughs> now, now, this bunch of icing on the I was amazed myself. Really. Oh, my. I was like... <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I always do that. You, you did it. Now ask me now ask me what were the seasons I used. I did not write it down. Uh, <laughs> of course not. No, why would you do that? Yeah, I, I, don't, do, I don't do that either. I but just you know it all the time and then I never I write anything not. down. I'm like, how did I make that again? I don't remember. <laughs> I, could not, I could not figure it out. And I think I think I had some left. I'm telling you the truth, because it's up there. And I put it in a sandwich bag, but I didn't write down what I used it for. So the season was in the plastic. I said, is this the season I used on this oven roast? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and I was never able to create that again. That was when I was in, you know, we get in those malls. Oh yeah, I'm doing, I'm in the uh -huh. spice thing now. I'm doing yep. all the spices. Uh, that, I'm gonna put this together and that together. <laughs> And it was when I was and when I was in culinary school when I did. Yep, that, but you yep. know, you're in culinary school, you come home. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, yep. this, I'm you get that. inspired. You really yeah. get inspired. Yeah, I was on bread cook. and stuff like that back then. Oh, ooh, yeah. you come home yeah. right from making bread in class to coming home to making bread at home. My boyfriend was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you making today? Keep it up, keep it up. Now it's like I'm too bug on tired to do that one right now. Oh, were well, you gonna say something? Were you gonna say something? Uh, for for that very reason, you know, all you mentioned, all of you mentioned that you you know you forget what you put together. Uh -huh. That's why I take. <laughs> That's why I take what? <laughs> That's why you won. I remember, you know, later on what I did. So what did he say? And, I missed it. Yeah, you can go back to the pictures and sort of figure it out. Oh, okay. but, oh you take the pictures. Oh, yeah. take the picture. I didn't think of that. I was just making, I think I had some cayenne in it and I had some 
paprika and maybe some um, onion powder. Sometimes uh, you go back powder. and taste it. Huh? Sometimes you go back and taste it. I did when I cut into that chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, the, the stuff that you had left. Yeah. Like, and just kind yeah, of but taste you know it. What? You know what? It's in my head. How much did I put? Did I put up? Oh, okay. Oh, How much? Gotcha. After this, and did I taste it? And did I have to add to it? All gotcha. that time. Well, one day I'm gonna put that that chicken up for you. You're gonna say, <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't doctored up. That's not Photoshop. That was for real. I, let me tell you, I was like high on the hog. <laughs> <laughs> But um, Paul, um, yeah. before we leave, I would like you to leave us with something because it was such a pleasure to have you here. Yes. And Jackie and I are going to look for you um, in two weeks to come to our meeting. Um, and I really want to thank you. So what would you like to leave us with? I'll, I'll, leave, you, I'll leave you with three things. Three things. Okay. With Anthony. <laughs> first, first, first thing is... Uh, but taught, taught me and, and my brother and sister on how to cook. But I got create creativity from my pop because I remember one night coming home, he whatever was in the whatever was in the refrigerator, he threw into a pot and it tasted good. So uh -huh. I get some of that creativity from him. Uh -huh. um, and, then, and then, and then number two. Um, our first meeting was actually through your website, through your through your platform on Facebook. I, I found it somehow, uh, the culinary school. Yeah. Um, All right. And I joined. He joined our community. Club. Right. That. Uh, and then when when we get connected, um, I start connecting dots and and bringing you into my into my environment. But I also want to share. So. You've had some very good conversations with with other folks uh, in the arts world, and I hope you bring bring more of those folks on uh, okay. to be a part of your world. And then the last thing I didn't forget, I use a sous vide wine. <laughs> <laughs> it took him a while to remember, but he. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna. I was dead dead. <laughs> I use <a> <laughs> and I'm thinking about it. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, Anthony, uh, what can I say, Paul? It was a pleasure to have you on the show today, and you clearly uh, you come from a place of creativity and. Uh, Love the stuff that you post on the uh, on the HCCC um, Facebook page, and you know, it's always it's always great to talk about food. Yes, always great to yes. talk about food. Yes, yes. yes. and Matthew. <laughs> um, I love your freedom, Paul. Not saying you know, if everybody else here, same here, but Paul, just meeting you, I love the freedom that you um display and I can't wait to see a lot more of your creations because um I'm one of those chefs cooks whatever um I critique myself constantly and I don't think it's a I think we all do make, that. right we have to do that for me it's like I'm a perfectionist I'm not saying that no one else is I'm a perfectionist uh -huh. and I'm always critiquing myself and my sister as well as my the rest of my family and friends are constantly like just stay stay free. Yeah, you, you got to realize you are free with whatever you're doing. You are you really are free when you create. It's from love and freedom. So I love what like the freedom that comes from you in reference to culinary, and we need a lot right. more of that. Amen to that, Jackie. Amen. And I'll just, I, I'll just say that I never in my life considered Thank myself you. a creative person. Ever. Oh, oh. In any store, endeavor. I'm sorry. At I'm all. sorry. The store is Walmart. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Before, I had a sneaky moment. I'm sorry to interrupt you. 
But I would have definitely forgot again. And definitely, <laughs> the show would be finished. I said, I'm hot. I mean, <laughs> of all the stores in the world, I know, you right? forget, you forgot Walmart? <laughs> I'm sorry, Anthony. Oh my <laughs> gosh! <laughs> anyway, I was just going to say, piggybacking on what Jackie was saying, I never, I never considered myself to be a creative person mm-hmm. until I started cooking. So, cooking became my creative outlet, uh, and 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 it convinced me that I was a creative person. I had a creative license. And it was through cooking. I just didn't realize it until late in life. Yeah. And the same with me. I've cooked all my life. Um, then after I retired, I said, what am I going to do? I wanted to go to Hudson for web design. They didn't have it. I said, what else could I take? And I said, oh, culinary. And that's when it, it hit me. And I was just so fortunate, you know, and I met Jackie there at the, at the college also um, for me to to enhance on what I've learned. But there's one thing I did do when I, the first day, well, when I went to the school and they showed me the the kitchen, I was like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. But when I put on all those whites and I had my knives in my hand Mm -hmm. and I walked into that classroom, everything that I learned all of my life, I left on the outside of the door and went in there like I never cooked before. And that's how I learned because I didn't want to go in and say, oh, well, I did this before and I mess it up. Right. You don't want to bring your baggage or your biases to the to the class. Yeah. You want to just start. So it was on the outside. And then I finally learned how to cut an onion. The right. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it actually reminds me of a, of a story. Because um, I was talking to a musician uh, and he was you know, going through this period of, of trying to figure out you know, how to be creative or, or do something in, in a creative vein, and, and he was sort of stuck. Mm. Um, so it made me think of, about uh, uh, an artist that, that I like listening to, David Sanborn. Awesome. Uh, Love David Sanborn. Yeah. Yeah. He's this one thing, he went through this period where, um, you know, he's, 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 he's creative as all heck. And, yeah. and he, mm-hmm. and, create some, some unbelievable music. But he, yeah. he said performances were just getting really, really sloppy. And this is him being you know, critical of himself. Right. And, and so he said, I needed to go back to square one to mm-hmm. relearn the right way of how to play my music that yeah. I've been playing all years. Right. And if I had done that, I probably would have gotten out of, you know, I might have gotten out of the music industry. Oh, yeah, wow. um, because now I think it's much tighter, it's more vibrant, and I'm more free in, yeah. in my creativity. I went back to basics. Yeah, and that's that's what I did. Left it all behind, and I was I was really, really, really surprised at the things that I thought I knew, mm-hmm. but I didn't know. Right. Right. You, you see what I'm saying? And I really acted dumb with uh, with Chef Claude. <laughs> And old Molly, <laughs> imagine yeah. these are the chefs after school, Jackie. Imagine if I act like that when Chef Puck, what would have happened? He would have. Oh, God. he would have seen. <laughs> oh my! God. No, no, I shouldn't say that because Puck had a cool side to him. He really yeah. did. He could. He's see like the, the Gordon Ramsay. Yes. The college, but he could see the BSs a mile away. He yeah. was a good, I thought he was a good chef, but he didn't tolerate people trying to walk all over him. So he had oh, no. to set a tone. He really did. Mm-hmm. And Luckily, I, oh, I, I didn't have him in my class. I didn't have him. He didn't teach me because... I had him a few times. And I mean, he yelled, but he didn't really... He wasn't crazy with me. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the bad girl. No, he just wasn't crazy <laughs> with me. I, I, I kind of understood the life of, you know, culinary life. That's your chef. You got to respect him. You want to earn the respect. Don't yeah. come in there with this attitude like, I'm no, I'm the, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Get yeah. humble quick. Get humble yeah. quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, folks, well, thank you again for being here. Thank Our pleasure. You, my pleasure. Thank you. Our pleasure. Awesome. And um, for those who will tune in later on, because we only have a few people here, but it's a beautiful day, and I don't blame them for being outside. 
So I will be putting this up on my website and I'm doing over the website. So eventually you'll see the new site. But in the meantime, yes, I'm doing it all over. <laughs> 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 Jackie knows where that comes from. <laughs> we have our weekly meeting at the end of our, our uh, uh, what I say, important meeting at the end, the last 10, 15 minutes. That's where we let our hair down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have to read Joe. Can we have a, Paul, just beware. Because we all get together, and at the very end, that's the fun part of it. Oh, and cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you, folks. And Great talking to much, all of you. It's not yes. goodbye. It's not goodbye. It's I'll see you later. See you I'll later. see you later. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Have bye bye. Everybody. Stay safe and wash your hands. Okay. Peace. Yeah. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>